All right. Uh, pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law and the governor's March 15th order imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place due to the outbreak of the coronavirus, this meeting of the Town of Berlin Select Board will be conducted by a remote participation. No in-person attendance of, me of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time. Town of Berlin will use best efforts to post an audio or video recording, transcript, or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the town's webpage, the town's YouTube channel. Approved minutes will be posted to mytowngovernment.org. For this meeting, members of the public who wish to attend the virtual meeting may attend via the Zoom webinar platform in one of two ways, with both audio and video access or by telephone audio only. Should any board member have technical difficulties and or lose access to the meeting, the meeting will recess for a period of time to see whether access can be restored. If not, the meeting will be continued to another date agreed to by a majority of the board or adjourned until our next scheduled meeting. All right, we'll bring the uh, meeting to order at 7.04. Um, we have approval of the November 6, 2020 open session meeting minutes. Do I hear a motion? So moved. So moved. There you go, in second. Second. See, We're, see? see You're Mary all good. gets to choose. <laughs> All right. Any comments or questions on the minutes? No, look good. Okay. Yeah, fine. <clears throat> and we'll take a vote. Keith, aye. Stone, aye. Hawkins, aye. That's unanimous. Uh, I don't believe we have any correspondence. No, there's no correspondence tonight. And so it's time for um, general public comment. So if you could please raise your hand if you have a comment <clears throat> so that we can let you into the uh, to the room. No comments. No comments. No hands raised. <clears throat> then we'll move on to our hearings and appointments. And the first one is the treasure collector. So we need to move him in. He's in the attendee, I think. Here he is. Can you hear me? Yep. Hi, Dennis. Hi. You can. I'll get started. Hi, Dennis. Um, probably the priority. Um, oh. Sure. There he is. There he is. Okay. Um, I'll get started then. The um, excuse me. Um, hi, Jill. Um, Mary Dennis is going to go first, and then we can promote Jill and Sue when Dennis's update is done. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Um, big topic is tax collections. Um, we're starting to see the effects of COVID, but in kind of a weird way. The tax title list for this year from the 2020 taxes is about $50,000. Uh, the actual tax is 44, the CPA is 589, and the total in tax title was 50,600. Um, one of the problems with the tax titles is since I've been here, every year it was always land or the occasional household that we worked a deal out and we could get through. Um, there are now 16 that went into tax title, all but a couple were residents or commercial property. So now we're talking about people living in their house. They're a little bit behind. Um, two of the properties that you need to be concerned about is Taylor Island down at 495. Um, they have two parcels, Shiro's Restaurant, which is two parcels, one being the cliff coming off 495, uh, which is land I only an abutter would want. 
Um, there are two expired deferreds. And when people defer taxes, one of them is a full-blown tax title now. The other is we know they're not going to pay until they sell the property. So that one I'm not too concerned about. Interest on all these properties now becomes 16% instead of 14. We still have the Tolman house, the Burndown house, the Bon is only property. And now we also have by the tracks. So that's another property that we have to deal with. Um, and you all know the history there. We do have good news. One redemption is coming uh, and we've been working on it for quite a few years. Uh, it is going to give us $84,000. Of that, June will track 32.5 in taxes. Um, we've earned 35,000 in interest and they'll be covering our approximately $13,600 in legal fees that this old property has generated over the years. Um, the current taxes past due is roughly 10%. So we're at 90%, which is pretty good for this time of year. But it's been an odd year. We've received all the money from the bankrupt companies. Sears paid, uh, Filene's, Penny's, Macy's, um, at least the first half. And we weren't expecting that. Um, we usually receive 1.2 million from a company called CoreLogic. It comes on the last day of the year. And um, they're basically the collection point for all the banks and, and financial institutions in the country. This year, the banks are paying directly. So we've had lots of little chopped up amounts of 600,000, 70, 80,000. Um, and it's added up to about that 1.2 million. So we're not out anything, but it's not normal. So I don't know if people are just gonna use their local banks now, or if it will eventually kind of segue over to CoreLogic again, They're the biggest in the country. Um, the other thing that's happened is usually it's busy in the beginning, and then in the middle of the month, it gets kind of slow, and then money comes in at the end, but it's very manageable. This year, on the last two or three days, it was raining individual checks, huge volumes. Uh, and we're just clearing it up now. We have another probably 40,000 in the bank for Unibank and we'll be uh, in pretty good shape, except for the folks that are on the list. We do have concerns. And one of them I was asked earlier today, and I don't wanna take up too much time, but the Riverbridge Hotel hasn't paid and the River Bridge, I don't know what they are. They get so darn many names that are River Bridge, but it comes to about $200,000. We also have someone called Joe Teach or Joe Tetch, who owes probably over 100,000, maybe 120,000 for the multiple properties that he's bought up in town. So when I get done with the list, there's a few more. It's just a handful of people that equal about half of the 600 that's owed a little bit under 600. So we're gonna go into second round. We really can't move legally until the second half next spring, but we will send out duplicate bills and try to collect. And most of it will come in, but we do have our usual group that play the game. Um, but I don't see it as a major impact on cash flow. Uh, unless they don't pay. So it's pretty easy to see what's going to happen and I'll keep you posted. One of the things I wanted to talk to you about tonight is CPA and the tax software. We have tripled, well, we will now that there's interest. We have tripled the amount of entries it takes to track everything. The system does not handle CPA well. And June found part of the law that we weren't aware of, that we have to divide past due interest between the tax bill and the CPA. It's not working, we have to do it manually and you can imagine what that's like. If somebody makes a 10 cent interest payment, it's easy because CPA doesn't get anything or whatever the amount is. But when you get into the bigger numbers, we have to break them down by hand. I've written a routine, the boys have it in the other room, not a problem. 
it just takes time. The software isn't set up to handle the CPA. The other problem is when we extended the credit a few months, they encode interest at point that cannot be removed. So it creates all sorts of problems when you go another 30 days and there's a little bit of interest that was added on that. Fortunately, under $5, we don't have to give it back, but it's embarrassing. The small screen is a real problem. Um, when Richard did it before, it was bigger, but we've upgraded the software. It's written in DOS. I think I was a kid. Um, yeah, I, Dennis, I'm glad you brought that up. This is a DOS-based system. It's, yes. That's exactly what's showing on, their, on the screen. It's the point software is becoming increasingly obsolete. Fewer and fewer towns are using it. Sorry, just to add that. <laughs> And you run the fear of no one supporting it. You know, I don't know how the company's doing, but it's a one owner kind of a company and it's been around forever. They're trying to get into the collection business, but Kelly and Ryan pretty much has it locked up. So we'll see. But the small screen is an eye strain. And the way the software was written back in the DOS days, if you go backwards to do something, you can wipe out what you've done. There's, there's no safety features that modern software has. Um, and it, it's a real problem. Um, we also have, a, so we're going to be asking for your support, hopefully, at this budget coming up for 2022, uh, to support the software for the tax collector's office. It's about $7,500 in blackmail to get your data out of the old company. But if we approach it properly, hopefully he'll work with us. Um, and then there'll be the fee for the new software, but we'll deal with that when it comes. We also have a little bit of problem with communication in our office. Uh, it's one of the goals that I'm trying to improve, but the physical layout, and because there's only one possible screen per point without tons of money and extra charges, uh, it makes it difficult to answer more than one customer at a time. So it really is a problem. Um, and it's really going to affect us in the future. Um, I think that's it on taxes. If no one has any questions, cash flow we're flush right now. Um, we are also have been at the um, financial team meetings talking about going to quarterly billing. We didn't go this year because we had that complete reval, or uh, we didn't know how it was going to come out. And we thought it was just too much to do both at the same time. Um, I don't know if it's a good idea to do it putting in the new software, but that will be up to uh, Vedar and um, the financial team to talk about in the future, but we'll keep you posted. Quarterly billing has some pluses and it has some minuses, depending on how you borrow. Um, cash flow, at least you can use last year's uh, amounts. We don't have to wait for the selectmen and the assessors to set the tax rate. It involves a little bit of work in the spring when you have to integrate the actual tax rate, but it's something, I don't know, Margaret, 80% of the towns and cities already do, including a lot more that are smaller than us. So uh, it's the future. It um, does uh, It does add a little more administrative work as well because you're doing it four times a year instead yes. of twice. Yep. Um, well, like I mentioned before, I've been watching the big guys and they're the ones that have paid up. However, the solar farm on the Wheeler property paid the taxes, but they didn't pay the CPA. We haven't had time to get in touch with them. They're on our list of things to resolve once we get the final cash in. Um, but we have not received, and don't forget this could change in a day or two, but so far, no payment from the Randall Road Solar. They owe us $22,000. Um, and they're part of that long list. Nothing yet from National Lumber. Doesn't make sense. Lumber companies are out straight making money. Riverbridge Hotel, as I mentioned. Um, it, but that brings up the issue of emails I just saw when I came in the office. Um, now that they're past due, we really need to look at the licenses and see if we have to use that as a credit, um, a collection mechanism. It worked the last time. Um, the last one we did was for AT&T and Sprint or somebody bought somebody up at Island Commons and we wouldn't let them put a sign up till they paid us uh, and it worked. 
So we need to do that um, with the list Mary's been doing for alcohol and other permits. Um, borrowing, if you have no questions on cash flow or the taxes, borrowing is at an all time low. And it's gotten to the point where even though the market is booming some days, it's allowed some towns to have up to 10% of what they need to be covered by the premium. Uh, we weren't so lucky, a few of the towns haven't been lucky. It's all based on timing. And it could be some announcement in the morning that just totally changes the market. And there could be good news or it could be bad news. And if you happen to pick that day to borrow, uh, you don't make as much in the premium as you do if you pick the good day. And it's no magic to it, it's just dumb luck. And the way the market's going now, as opposed to back when we borrowed, um, some of the ones that I've looked at today on the comparison yields made incredible amounts of money that they could apply towards what they had to borrow. So 10% is a big, a big nut. Um, and the rates are so low. Um, CPA is one of the options. And we have no debt really other than the highway bond and what the school passes to us. And the um, CPA borrowing or some of the debt that comes out of the capital planning, which I haven't heard anything that would require it, uh, now would be a good time to borrow if we had to. Um, speaking of that, if we're working on the regional agreement, cash flow here has been terrible as well as it has been in Boylston uh, because they pay the big pay in the spring, but they're billing us originally because of the agreement in the, in the fall. So basically they're taking a lot of our money and making interest on it. And it just sits there till the spring when they make their big payment. They borrow the opposite of what we do. Excuse me, Dennis, that is one area actually that the board has um, expressed an interest in discussing with the district. Good. Um, I think that's it on borrowing. Uh, we have the most amazing credit rating because of that. We have one of the lowest debt ratios right now in the state. Uh, there's a lot of towns that wish they had that. Um, uh, so we feel pretty good about that. Um, payroll and personnel. Uh, we've had a problem with the software for over a year and no one could figure it out. And I finally found a person there this week, as a matter of fact, that fixed a major problem with their software. And it should cut down on the few errors that do happen. You know, they do happen, I'll admit it, but they're easily fixed most of the time. Um, they have made it so that all of the able categories come up clean as opposed to me hunting and pecking to try to find the right one for that particular person. We have probably 12 or 15 categories that affect taxes, affect retirement. Uh, you kind of have to know what you're doing. The other thing that's come up is, I would love to see us go to an email payroll where everyone gets their checks, they can look online. Unfortunately, it only saves the delivery fee. It really doesn't save the printing for some reason. It must shifting, excuse me, Dennis, shifting to something like a bi-weekly payroll, we're one of very few communities left that's doing a weekly payroll. Right. Um, over time, looking at a bi-weekly payroll that would achieve some cost savings that could be shifted to um, you know, to the cost to do the, um, the email uh, yep. direct okay. deposit. Um, the one thing we need though is a clean, well-maintained employee email file. Um, they change them night and day. It's, it's who's gonna do it, but we have emails that people put on applications and they change before you get to use them. So it's just something we have to think about. That's the only downside that um, they could come up with at Harper's. Um, we've been pretty busy actually with paperwork. We have the, the master form that goes around the PAF. It works pretty well, but there's some flaws that any system would have just from who gets what when and missing information. If we could afford to do fillable forms, the online forms would work great. Unfortunately, about 50% of the forms that come in from that 
I have to send back because they're not witnessed, they're not filled out right. Um, all of them aren't complete. And, you know, I debate bringing it all back in house, but even that creates a problem here. Um, and there's a lot of things that are affected by the paperwork that most people don't see, including rules that I have to deal with at the state with retirement things. And it creates a lot of work when I have to chase people. So that's something to think about. Unemployment fraud, the last item on my list, I think. No, I got a couple more. I was waiting for you to, I was waiting for you to get to unemployment fraud. This has been a major problem. And I know at the manager's meeting, I kind of held up. Uh, 14 people have created this much paperwork. And unfortunately, most of the treasure is in my thread and I'm not sure Margaret has threads and, and June does. We're very upset that all this time, they knew this was going on at the national level and at the state level. But the first thing you'd expect to see when you log into their system is, is this a fraudulent account if you're an employer? Instead, we find out about it after they've talked to the person. They know what the people make because they're using real social security numbers. They know what I made. They know what the other people that have been affected made to the penny. And they determine how much it's gonna cost the town. And that's the first time you're aware of it. Unfortunately, nowhere in that form does it let you stop it. It goes to the next level. So you're hoping the employee gets in on their end. We send out a packet to everybody. Do this on your end, I'll do it on my end. Um, but so far, they're letting the, the four or five forms we have to fill out. Now they're telling us how to fill them out wrong instead of stopping the process. So the other thing that has happened is, I don't know if these are jokesters or whatever, but on the first group of people, two or three of them had new monetary decisions happen. So they kind of had to go back and change what they were already changing their passwords on. Uh, it's a big problem. So we get nothing done. You know, it takes about an hour to get in there. I figured out how to lie gracefully. Um, and hopefully you don't get any complaints from my opinion, but it's the same opinion all the treasurers and collectors are saying is, you know, this is your fault. There's ways you could have stopped this. You're wasting a lot of people's time. Um, and, you know, that's where we're at on it. One of the complications is they're not billing us until next spring, I believe it is, because of COVID, they're being nice. So that's it. Um, earnings, we don't even have to talk about the interest we're going to earn because everyone knows what the uh, market's like. The hotel and meals tax does not look encouraging. We do need no, to, it, we found out me, that Dennis, we, Excuse me, Dennis, we have Jill and Sue in the audience. Um, so uh, they are ready to go when you are, when you're all set. Benefits is my last subject. <laughs> oh boy. Oh, there you go. Um, what a segue. We have had the um, first meeting with Cooking Company and we first met with Maya. Maya has been our vendor for a while and they can meet any of the requirements that the GIC can offer and we won't go into details about that. But um, we all agree that the plan needs work and we'd like to do it in a manner that this time we're aware of our deadlines and we're aware of what needs to be done and then we make the decision about the plan being fair to the employee and being fair to the town and, and the budget. So with that, I'll bring in Jill or you can bring in Jill. Yep. Hi, good evening, everybody. How are you? Good. Hey, how are you? Jill. Thanks for having us tonight. And, and I asked Sue Shalu to join us in, as well because two heads are always better than one. <laughs> Sue is the president of Cook and Company and Jill is the vice president. Okay. Nice to meet you all. So as Dennis was mentioning, um, I, we are with Cook and Company, uh, which you recently brought us in to help you uh, look over your health insurance uh, costs and needs. And uh, so we're sort of at the beginning of that process. Uh, and I've had uh, a, a several initial discussions uh, with Dennis, as well as with the representative from Maya. 
uh, Tara Fafford, and um, we have also uh, met and uh, and Margaret has joined us as well. Uh, so just recently, we did have um, a meeting with Maya, and uh, we were kind of discussing um, what to expect for the town's health insurance for the coming fiscal year. Um, so I'm not really sure if everybody's really familiar with how the health insurance plan, how the model works at Maya, uh, but typically uh, the way that it works is as a member of the Maya Trust, uh, I believe the town of Berlin is one of 139 or 40 other municipalities. Um, so typically Maya will set a range of rates, um, a maximum rate of increase, a minimum rate of increase and an average rate of increase for all of their membership. And that changes every year based on all of the membership's claims. Uh, and so this year, well, every year actually, the, the, that rate range is announced at the end of January. Uh, and then it's usually a couple of weeks after that where they have your individual rate of increase. So sometime in uh, probably mid-February early to mid-February is when the town of Berlin really knows what they'll be looking at for a rate of increase. Um, and so what, um, what the Meyer rep shared with us in our meeting um, a week or so ago was that they are expecting the town of Berlin to receive upwards of the maximum rate of increase uh, of whatever that range may be. Um, so the last couple of years, this max has has been coming down. So it has been a lower rate of increase or a lower ceiling, if you will. Uh, but still, no one likes to be at the max. Uh, so she was indicating to expect somewhere between possibly an eight to a 10% increase, um, which, you know, that's, that's a pretty hefty rate of increase. Um, and I, I look at that when I compare it to the cost of medical inflation in medical trends, which running between um, seven to 8%. Um, so thinking that the town's rates may be coming above that and you know, what is the cause of that? And also, you know, what can we do to uh, mitigate that? And so I was invited this evening to talk with all of you about what could potentially be done, some strategies that we could impose to help slow down that rate of increase um, so tonight, really, I wanted to talk to you um, about your plan design and also the process of looking at sections 21 through 23 of Mass General Law, Chapter 32B, and how using that law can help the town um, change its co-pays and deductibles and change its plan design to reduce cost and use the... Uh, the law in a way that helps you get to your end goal in a shortened period of time. Um, so I'm gonna just kind of go through this in a high level, but if anybody has <coughs> questions, I'm happy to, to slow down and answer them. And Sue, if it's something I'm skipping over, feel free to jump in. Um, but just as a little bit of a background um, in a comparison of where the town of Berlin's health plan is at, um, and I, I've been involved with the town for many years um, in my prior um, role at Maya, so I can speak to um, knowing a lot about your health plan. The plan you, that you offer through Blue Cross Blue Shield is a very rich program, and, and I say that because I compare it to what other municipalities have in place for their health plans. Um, the plan that you offer has not had any real impactful changes to it in well over a decade. And because of that, it is, um, it's falling behind where other municipalities are at the level of plan design. And it's becoming, uh, at some times you could say unsustainable from a cost perspective. Um, and again, when we talk about cost and sustainability, we're looking at you know eight to ten percent increases year over year over year to afford this very rich plan, and some would call it an, even an antiquated plan. Um, so the plan that you offer the employees is um, has no deductible, 
and it has a $15 copay for office visits and it has a $50 copay for emergency room visits. And then it does have prescription drug co-payments as well, 10, 20, or $35, depending on the tier of the medication. Um, so that in itself is tends to be a very rich plan. It doesn't have a lot of cost controls for big ticket um, medical services, such as surgeries or high-tech radiology or imaging like MRIs or inpatient stays at the hospital. So because of that, that's one of the reasons that the rates have been rising as they have been over the few years. Even though you do have um, what I would call a little bit of a safety net with Maya because they do cap it, but in a year where the whole um, Maya Health Trust may not be running well, then that's gonna kind of fire back on, on the town of Berlin and you get stuck with a high rate of increase. So ways that you could consider mitigating those, those rates of increase year over year would be to increase your co-pays and your deductibles. And, and Dennis knows, with, you know, these discussions have been happening for many years um, with the employees, with the insurance advisory committee, which is made up of uh, employees from the town. Uh, so it hasn't really come to fruition. There haven't really been any, you know, there's been a lot of discussions and I'm um, sure heated moments uh, where some agree that ch change should come and others disagree or even to the level of change. Um, so tonight I'm here to really talk to you about how you can maybe speed up that process and how you could um, reach your goals in a way that doesn't you know, get you going through this cycle for another five to 10 years while still incurring these exorbitant expenses. And that is through sections 21 through 23. Um, and again, this was a uh, Massachusetts healthcare reform law that was passed in 2011. And it's really a way for cities and towns to um, adopt plan design changes and sort of bypass the traditional collective bargaining methods and do it in a much more condensed timeline. And it also allows for an equitable um, way for employees to also receive um, some kind of uh, mitigation, I guess would be the word for uh, making those changes. So the law would require you, um, it's, a, it's one package deal. It's you adopt sections 21, 22 and 23 all together. And sections 21 is really just adopting the law. Once you have adopted it, you then decide, well, then you decide if you want to uh, go with section 22 or section 23. So you don't have to make any of those decisions up front when you're first adopting the law. That can be done after the fact. And that's why you would adopt all of them at the same time. Um, the, adopting the law just really allows you to go through the process. And again, it's a much more streamlined, condensed process. Um, so section 21 adopts, it, it implements the law. And then section 22 allows you to make uh, plan design feature changes, copay and deductible features, uh, changing to the level that match or are up to or no higher than the level of the most subscribed to plan in the group insurance commission. So in some, some places call it the, the benchmark plan, some call it the GIC lookalike plan. Um, so I, I refer to it as the benchmark plan. Uh, and right now that plan in the GIC is the Tufts Navigator. Uh, so we would look at the co-pays and deductibles that match that plan. And implementing section 22 doesn't necessarily require you to accept those exact co-pays and deductibles. It just allows you to go up to that level. 
So you wouldn't necessarily have to go as far as those plans. And in fact, you may that may not be where we even recommend the town of Berlin to go because you have really low co-pays. That might be a really tough um, jump in plan structure for your employees, but it would allow you to do so if, if that's the direction that you wanted to go in. And then section 23 would be actually um, entering and transferring into the GIC itself. And again, that is, can be decided after you adopt the sections and you go through the plan design analysis and see what is going to be most beneficial for the town to, to meet its goals. Any questions on that so far? <laughs> so the, you, you would bypass uh, negotiations with the union by accepting um, 21 through 23? Yes, to a certain degree. So I appreciate the question. I should clarify that. Um, so it, as I mentioned, it does um, condense the timeline. So it would really be about a 75 to a 90 day window of time from the time it is implemented or the time that it's invoked uh, mm -hmm. to the time that it's implemented. So let's, let's just say, for example, you adopted it. You could actually hold off on implementing or invoking it until however long you want. You could, you could adopt it and wait a year before you do anything with it. I'm not suggesting that you do that, but, <laughs> um, but it does allow you to make a decision and make a proposal to the employees. Um, and then once you decide to invoke, once the town actually knows what it would like to propose, uh, you would then have a couple of weeks of work uh, meetings with your insurance advisory committee. And then that would actually transfer into a, a PEC, a public employee committee, uh, which then change to, changes to a negotiating body. And then you would have a 30 day negotiation period. Once you have that negotiation period, the town would um, be able to accept counter proposals from the employees. But mostly what happens during that time is the plan design is accepted and the employees are really negotiating on how they want the savings to be mitigated. And so I mentioned that earlier that, that it would be equitable for employees as well. And so the law, the uh, statute actually requires the town to provide 25% of the first year's plan savings. And that 25% has to be given back to the employees the, the, in the labor groups. And so during that 30 day negotiation period, that's typically where that's decided upon is how that 25% savings is going to be returned to the employees. And then you do have to implement it, you have to inform the employees uh, no less than 60 days before the plan goes into effect. So if we look at this from um, uh, uh, an actual timeline standpoint, let's just say, for example, the town is, is interested in making a change uh, this coming July 1st. That would mean that you, you know, backing up from that period, you would have to inform your employees of that change no later than May 1st. That would be 60 days, which means that it, you would have to have finalized all of your negotiations um, you know, by let's say mid-April, which means you would have to back up even further to probably around February, sometime in early February to really start the process. So if you back it up even further, <laughs> that means you would have to adopt the sections sometime in December or at the very latest early January so that we could then go through the analysis and look at what plans would make sense to propose to the town to reach or to the employees in order for the town to reach its goals. 
And then once you invoke, the, the process starts and the clock starts ticking. So I, I think Margaret may have shared with you a timeline piece. Yeah. And that kind of consolidates everything so that you can see how quickly everything moves. It is a pretty stringent timeline. Uh, and, and that is by design um, so that there are no um, delay tactics. Um, and, and as we know, it's been many years that the town's tried to make changes and unfortunately has not been able to do that. So that's why I'm recommending that this board seriously considers adopting this um, section of the law. Jill, is there no way to um, merge with any other town or to have the town employees, you know, do a one-off, uh, maybe uh, Boylston, you know, has a plan that they like? I mean, is it just confined to Berlin has to have a plan that we have to stick to? We can't, you know, go to Clinton, see what they have, go to Hudson, see what they have and merge Berlin into another municipality? Theoretically, you, you certainly could do that. And I think there has been discussion with, uh, well, I know that you used to be joined with the Berlin Boylston School District, and that has definitely made your group a lot smaller. Um, and that the town of Boylston is also in Maya. Uh, so obviously that any uh, other community that you join, you would have to have the same plan design and it can get a little bit tricky if your rates are much higher than their rates okay. or vice versa. And also if you don't agree on the plan design. Um, so, you know, I think within Maya, they would certainly allow you to join the town of Boylston. The question is, does Boylston want to join with Berlin? Mm. And is that going to be savings for the, you know, for everybody, for all parties? Um, and then as far as looking at other communities outside of Maya, such as um, I think Hudson, Hudson is uh, a group that we work with as well. Um, Sue, is Hudson self-funded? Yes. Okay. Um, so, you know, those would have to be discussions that, you know, you would have to have with those individual municipalities. Um, and, you know, but one thing I can tell you is that being in the Maya Health Trust does permit you to have a little bit of cushion versus being completely out on your own. So being in a joint purchase group, um, even though you have seen, you know, somewhat high rates of increase has still buffered the town versus had it not been in the joint purchase group. Um, so, you know, it's, it's just, they're not easy, easy solutions. Understood. Thank you. Appreciate it. Sure. Could, could we adopt this and go down this path and still stay with Maya? Doesn't absolutely. Maya have options? Okay. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. That's a great question, Scott. So um, many, many communities all over the state, whether it doesn't matter where their health insurance comes from, um, any city or town or school district uh, under Chapter 32B is eligible to adopt this um, section of the law. And I believe a list was sent out there about... Um, Yep. I can't remember how many, but well over several columns that have adopted. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, and, and many uh, you know small and large size communities have used this this law. And then, uh, Dennis, I mean, you you and I, when I was on FinCom, have had conversations about the benefit plans and and the cost of health insurance as a proportion of our budget being huge. What about adopting twenty one to twenty three sort of I, what's been the barrier to us getting this done before and how would just adopting a state chapter get us over that hurdle? <laughs> we have a TA now. <laughs> yeah, actually, that's probably, that's probably the right answer, but. <laughs> yeah, Nobody um, had the time to look into it. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry, um, go ahead. Okay. Um, supposedly, Boylston's, the school system's having some case problems. So their rates may not necessarily work out well in the short term. As, so as part of this review, we also got to look at who qualifies for health insurance and who doesn't? Yes. Not, not for sections 21 through 23 if right. in right. particular. Right. Right. 
Right, but one of the other ways of cost savings is, you know, I, I believe I qualify for health insurance. I'm not taking health insurance, but I, I, I'm trying to figure out what other, what are the qualifications and are we being sort of too generous down that path? Because uh, it's one of those things I, I have tears about because as I believe full-time employees, especially when we don't have universal coverage, you know, and you get your insurance from your health, that we need to provide something that is decent decent coverage. And as we raise co-pays and raise deductibles and other stuff, we are passing a lot of costs onto those families. And so another way of looking at cost savings is to reduce the number of people who are covered. And so I, I just, as we go down this path, I want to make sure we're looking at that as well. Sure. I, I would also just mention that you're, you're a very small group. I think you have less than 40 employees. So comparatively to a large group, um, it actually can make you a little bit uh, more volatile because of the size of your group. So that might not necessarily be the answer uh, because what happens is that you have fewer people that to spread the, the risk through. And so when you have a very rich plan design, there are no cost containment methods that help control cost. So you, you could have you know 10 people on the plan but if they're sicker people, they're just right. going to drive up the costs for everyone. So that's right. kind of how that theoretically, how that works. Um, Sue, did you did yeah. you have a comment? Yeah, the only thing um, you had questioned how sections 21 through 23 could help you get over the hurdle of not being able to negotiate plan design changes. 21 through 23 was, um, implemented, as Jill said, back in 2011. And Jill went through the exact process that you follow, but the law allows you as the town to make these changes at the end of the 30 day negotiation period. Whereas if you are negotiating under traditional 150E negotiations, mm -hmm. if you don't get an agreement, you can't implement any changes. Whereas under 21 through 23, as long as those cost sharing components don't exceed those of the GIC at the end of the day, you will be able to implement those changes. Okay, thank you. Any other, Margaret. Um, uh, Jill or, or Sue, would you say that it would benefit the town um, to, um, investigate adopting 21 through 23, whether or not it stays with Maya. So in other words, is there a benefit to adopting it even if we pursue other groups? Actually, even more so I would say because making a carrier change or leaving the joint purchase group that you're in is, is an even bigger discussion and an even larger change to the employees than tweaking your co-pays and deductibles. Uh, so for instance, if you were going to leave Maya and go to Blue Cross directly, or if you were going to leave Maya and go into the GIC or what have you, I think that this law would allow you to do that. And again, it would streamline that entire process for you. Right. Thank you. And I do, just one point, I do think it's pretty clear that if the decision was to leave Maya and join another group, for example, the benefits will have to change because again, you offer such a rich level of benefits that any other group that you might look at joining would certainly have higher cost sharing components and you would be able to use the statute to negotiate those changes. Okay. That's a good point. Uh, any other questions? Uh, how you find plenty, you. plenty, but a lot, a lot to think <laughs> <Yeah>. about. <laughs> I guess there are going to be some next steps. Yeah. I'm, I'm certainly available if anyone has any thoughts after this meeting and, and didn't think of it now, but came comes up later. Um, we're happy to answer any questions anytime. And then Margaret and Chris, this is already on listed for new business at a future meeting, right? This is the presentation today will fall to new business and give us a chance to do votes and and think about so, this and remove it yes. for a bit. Let it yes, settle. It can be. Yep. 
so we at our, at our meeting um, at our meeting uh, that we had with Jill, we talked about December Monday, December fourteenth, having the consultant come back um, to explain the process in more detail, um, including the pot uh, potential savings um, through adopting twenty one through twenty three. It sounds like a, a, a decent idea to me. Uh, I guess maybe we just I, need to think about it I a would, bit. Right, I was gonna say, I, I would be helped if uh, the, the attachment that says, you know, 10 days for this and then 30 days for this, if we could figure out when we have to make it, when our when we'd have to make a decision about health insurance and work that way backwards, because mm -hmm. I really would hate to have us potentially, you know, discuss it for the first time December 14th and discover that had we, discussed it on December 7th, we could still make an implementation for fiscal year mm -hmm. 22. So you uh, want a date, date specific calendar working back from the implementation? Yeah, from the and, and implementation. generalities are fine. I just, again, I don't want to have us accidentally miss a, an opportunity because we, we just, we didn't know that information. I'm happy to prepare that for you, but just as a general thought, I would say if, if this isn't adopted by early January, it would be very difficult to make changes mm -hmm. for July 1st. Yep. But I, I will, I'll break it down and yep. I'm happy to do that for you. And I will leave you with one last thought on this. And, and you know, Sue and I have been through this with many, many communities. Um, and I will tell you that, you know, the employees, they don't like it. They're not going to be happy that you're doing this, but it certainly will engage them and it will bring them to the table to have a conversation. And so you may use this as a way of, of, um, you know, initiating that discussion. And, you know, maybe they don't like the plan that you initially proposed, but perhaps you could land on something lesser uh, and, and still somehow come closer to meeting your goal. So, so I do think that there is a lot of merit in the process. I think with an 11 year old plan or 10 year plus old plan, that there are many things that we could make that are not cost prohibitive that would actually make it a better plan for government that like mental health coverage today is not what it was a decade plus ago and some alternative medicine stuff and, and it could be that we raise co-pays and add some deductibles but we add coverage and things that we're not currently covering today that are not uh giant uh cost cost issues so i'm hoping we do something that that because i'd want to make sure we have some employee input that even if they're not happy the, that we find something that makes it as as good for the town and them as possible okay are there are there any further questions no lots to digest thank you jill and sue for uh inundating our brains <laughs> <laughs> <Thanks. laughs> anytime <laughs> thank you all right Thank you. Thank you so Have much. Have a great night. Have a nice evening. Take care. Thank you. Bye. All right. Uh, well, I'm tired. So, Margaret, could you make your TA report kind of quick? Absolutely. <laughs> I've only got four little stars here. Um, first, first, and first and foremost, um, I, I just want to wish everyone a safe and happy Thanksgiving. Um, you know, this is just a very, very unique and challenging time. And um, I just I just ask that everyone please, please try to abide by all the public health advisories um, to assure the safest Thanksgiving possible this year. Um, the FY22 budget process, I did give the board a copy of FinCom's draft FY, FY22 budget meeting schedule. Um, they have not changed that draft. So as it stands right now, um, that would be the tentative schedule of budget meetings with FinCon. So you should have all the dates. Uh, of course, the board is welcome to attend those, um, those meetings where the, um, where the departments, boards, and committees will present um, their budget requests and talk with FinCom about them. Uh, that starts in earnest in December. The Shared Streets and Spaces pilot project um, will be coming down on Monday, December 7th. The Traffic Safety Advisory Committee um, meeting has been scheduled for that night for a virtual community feedback session. Um, we are going to be gathering all comments received in writing to date. Um, we're going to be compiling comments that were received verbally. 
um, at the community outreach session um, and following the community outreach session. And we're gonna encourage residents to provide additional um, comments in writing and join that virtual meeting on December 7th at 6.30 p.m. And I'm sure later on what we have, um, this shared streets project was done through a grant. Uh, we have a final uh, pilot project report that's gonna be due at the end of December. Having this feedback from the meeting on December 7th will be very helpful for us in submitting our final report. Um, we're gonna be posting notices around and, and in the item and things um, uh, to, to deal with that, um, that virtual meeting. The next thing is the Community Preservation Act Committee. They have their next meeting scheduled next Tuesday, December 1st at 6.30 p.m. Um, they have gone through their training and this time they're going to be meeting to organize their committee and discuss developing a community preservation plan, which is a required component of local um, Community Preservation Act committees. They have to put a plan in place and there are plenty of templates they can borrow from. from. Um, the, uh, the state, um, on the date that the Community Preservation Act Committee had their training, uh, the state um, released its, um, its round of disbursements and Berlin had received its first uh, disbursement of state funds that day. Um, and that state disbursement totals more than $197,000. So that's in addition to the surcharge, the local um, the local surcharges that are imposed. So there's nearly um, nearly half a million dollars that's in the um, in the CP nice. fund at this point. Yeah. So, um, and then the next and last item is the um, River Bridge Development Agreement. Uh, Board Chair Chris Keith, uh, FinCom Chair Stan Rogalinski, and I will be meeting with the CENES to discuss a public safety mitigation payment plan. Um, hopefully we'll be able to come to some resolution on this so um, the town uh, can um, collect the money that is due according to the executed development agreement. So I'll keep you posted on that. That's it, short yeah. and sweet. <laughs> There's more in print. Very good. When you, when you have that meeting with River Ridge Development, uh, I think Dennis reported earlier in the meeting that they're they've missed a tax payment mm -hmm. and officially not a tax title. I think it's a good time to remind them that that, mm -hmm. that stuff is due. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. I would not make it a sore point of the meeting or like, you know, any mm -hmm. big part, but at least a gosh, we've noticed you've missed this. Yeah. Yeah. We'll do. Okay. Very good. Um, we will move on to old business and, um, reappointment of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, James Royer, Virginia Zukatinsky, and is it Suzanne Roberts? I believe so. I think she's, she's spelled it's it Suzanne. Suzanne. Oh, it's Susanna, Susanna Roberts. Yeah. Yep, that's what it is, <clears throat> Susanna. So um, uh, the board ready to make a motion to Reappoint them. Absolutely. I'll second. They've all done such a really good job. I have they to have. say. They have. And they're transitioning now to five year terms. This is the beginning of a multi year transition to five year terms. <laughs> well, it's nice because they bring with them lots of information. So, um, you know, you're not bringing somebody new up to speed. So, especially with something like ZBA, it's, it's nice to have them around and know that they want to come back and help. So, you know, hats yeah. off to, to them. And they even signed up knowing that they may have to start having hearings again. <laughs> <laughs> That's coming is quick. There, is there a reason why they can't have Zoom meetings like everybody else? I, they have, um, they, the, one of the laws that was enacted, one of the special laws that was enacted back in March due to COVID right. allowed um, land use boards to suspend uh, hearings. So um, right. the Berlin board did actually exercise their right to do that. So um, other towns so, yeah, may have had. Just wondering that the governor's orders on COVID allowed like we're meeting on Zoom and FinCom meets on Zoom. Mm -hmm. Why is it that, and this is not, I get this is not Berlin ZBA, but why could plan, planning groups not meet over Zoom? I think it was the amount of uh, information that had to be shared, whether it was maps or 
it was difficult to share on Zoom. That was one of the reasons. And, right? and marking and marking up those plans on Zoom. So I think that was a big challenge. So um, just feel bad for them because the things are just backing up. And so yes, they got this little bit. Once they're allowed to start meeting, one they might mm -hmm. be forced to meet when it's when everything is not settled. And, and the then you know, and then they'll, the, oh, there'll be so much backlog of things that could have ha that have been happening. They could, they're going to have twelve-hour meetings. I'm going to feel sad for them. <laughs> The legislature has um, has pulled that um, that provision that was given to um, the land use yeah. boards, and now they have to um, they have to start up again in December. So, yeah. So anyway, we've got a motion and a second. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll take a vote. Keith, aye. Stone, aye. Hawkins, aye. That's unanimous. Congratulations to those three. And we have. Um, uh, appointment of the members that the select board um, appoints to the CPA, um, James Holyoke and MJ Stades. Um, and I'm assuming that we're not appointing Julie Lee. I do have an old copy of the agenda. No, unfortunately, the law does not allow for the board to um, appoint a recreation committee member in the absence of a quorum of the recreation committee. But okay. I've encouraged Julie to keep attending the CPAC meetings um, so yeah. recreation has a voice. Yeah. Okay, so do I hear a motion for James and MJ? Ed Scott. Uh, so moved. And All so right. seconded. Okay, then we'll take a vote. Keith, aye. Stone, aye. Hawkins, aye. That's uh, unanimous. And uh, the next thing is to approve the Berlin membership in the Assabet Housing Partnership. Um, are there? It does me excited. <laughs> yeah, no, I was, a, I was a, just happy to see that come through. Yeah, it's a consortium, and uh, the planning board did vote um, to support petitioning to join the consortium um, at their last meeting. Um, if the board um, is so inclined, um, I would ask you to. Um, to vote your support as well, and we could prepare a petition. I did receive an email today from uh, Pam Helenek of Hudson, um, just indicating that they will be ready to receive our petition when we're ready to send it in. So um, they would be putting it on their meeting agenda for January 12th for admission so into the consortium. So Second in. Yep, get it up. Okay, let's take a vote. Keith, aye. Stone, aye. Hawkins, aye. Work so hard to, to get so above that 40B threshold. Doing what we can to preserve it is just amazing. Yeah. Um, okay. And are we skipping over the Highland Commons, uh, the Highland Wine and Spirits? No, that one is actually the change of manager application is okay. all set and ready to go. Okay. Then um, do I hear a motion to appoint John Michael David Keller? as the manager so, for Highland Wine and Spirits. So moved. I think it's silly that we have to vote on who manages these things, but yes, so moved. <laughs> and seconded. Okay, let's take a vote. Keith, I. Stone, I. Hawkins, I. Thank you. And in new uh, business, are you hearing that ding, ding, ding on my computer? It's not me. I'm hearing it. I think it's it's not on my end. I mean, I can hear it. You're hearing it? Yes. Yep. I got a so spinner, it's so it's me. not me. It's me. Yeah. <gasps> it's you. It's me. It's my kids are all texting each other. Yeah. And they're they're looking at baby pictures of one of my grandkids. I I guess I'm not looking at it, but I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I have my I have my phone here. It's on mute. I'm, I'm actually on call for work, so I'm kind of hoping they don't have any emergencies. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. So. Uh, Let's see, we've got proclamations, one for the town <laughs> clerk's office. Put it in your drawer, Chris. Open up your drawer, put it in your drawer. <laughs> no, it's my computer because it's got oh. it's it on it. So uh, see here I was tempted to like start texting Chris, but I know. I, know, I, I was going no, to I, I should everybody back. <laughs> I just text them back and say, remember, your mother has a meeting. <laughs> 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 oh well. So we've got the town clerk's office for handling the numerous 2020 elections. Um, yes. Do we want to do these separately? 
No, run them all together. Okay. Then we've got the Boston Post cane for the oldest living Berlin resident. And it's posthumously Paul Germain and then also Harold Lohr. So um, I know you've read the uh, proclamations in the Perfect. Google Drive. And um, if you agree, then we'll take a vote to approve them. So moved. And seconded. I want one of those pins. So how old do I need to be to get one of those little pins that were on the desk? Just gonna say, I, I was gonna like, I wanna see the, like, <laughs> talk, about, talk about the uh, the data task that's gonna be unending is let's put all the residents of Berlin in you know chronological order from the oldest to the youngest so I can like see it where I'm at at the list <laughs> and I'm moving up or down as people move in and. All right. <laughs> so if you go if you go in one day and that big one is missing behind us, you'll know where it is. Just drive yep. on up to Lyman. So there you go. <laughs> I think Chronicle or someone did a story recently about like the towns. There's not as many towns that are still moving along. A lot of towns have lost theirs. I think it is great that our town is not. Yeah. That's because we give out the pin instead of the king. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so we have a motion and a second. Uh, let's take a vote. Keith, aye. Stone Eye. Hawkins Eye. And I'm also proud of our town to get what, 89.6% yeah. voter turnout? Yeah. That was awesome. That's incredible. Yes. All right. And so that, that motion passes. And we move on to the town administrator's notice of intent to appoint full time and part time police officers. I hear. Oh, move to allow her to, to appoint them. <laughs> can we hear a little bit about them? You can. If you're allowed discussion after motions. All right. I'll second That's it. true. All right. All right. All right. Then before we take a vote, we're going to hear from Chief Galvin. So I hope uh, I hope both of them in the audience and get get promoted to the panel to meet you. Um, but we have um, two candidates tonight. Um, first, I'll start with part time. We actually started a part-time hiring process well before COVID. Um, and we got sidetracked and moved, uh, moved to a full-time hiring process um, and hired Officer Welch. Um, obviously, we know where that has landed us. Um, and then with COVID, uh, we didn't move forward with the part-time process because of, you know, we were still learning what was going on and, and not sure how we would handle field training and have someone that, you know, wasn't with our department all the time with another officer through that field training process. So it got quite delayed. Um, but we had made our just selection and uh, I had stayed in contact with, uh, with the candidate, uh, Dylan Soldi of Clinton um, throughout the project. And I, I really compliment oh, yeah. Dylan for remaining patient through this whole process. Um, you know, Dylan is a uh, is a member of the uh, the Fitchburg State University uh, police program. So it's a five year program at Fitchburg State. He'll be graduating this year and, and actually completing the full time police academy as well. Um, he works part time as a public safety dispatcher for the town of Clinton. Um, he also worked uh, as part of the security team and an EMT um, at Fitchburg State as well, um, and and brought a lot to us. He was the uh, you know the top choice overwhelmingly by the panel that did the interviews. Um, and I'm glad to welcome him to uh, to our department. So I don't know, Dylan, if you'd like to say hello and uh, <laughs> introduce yes, yourself. Hi. Uh, my name is Dylan Saldi. I know uh, Chief Galvin just gave me that great introduction, but I'll introduce myself briefly. I, um, I am a resident of the town of Clinton, born and raised. I wanted to be a police officer since I was about eight years old. Fun fact, I have a couple of family members that are police officers currently. Um, well, one of them, actually, my cousin, Officer Paul Sylvester, has been a town of Clinton police officer for about 34 years, and my great-grandfather, Floyd Snipes, who was a Lancaster police officer. So it's been a dream of mine for a while, and I'm thankful and happy to finally be a part of it, especially with the town of Berlin. It's a great community from the area. I love the people. You definitely can't beat them. So I'm excited. This is a Dylan, I was a little concerned when you said you were from the town of Clinton, and I'm thinking, yep. oh, he's Those... not really from Clinton. And then as you started talking, you're like, Clinton. I'm like, all right, yeah, he's real. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking the same. No, thing. Really yep. Mm -hmm. yep. And you pronounced Berlin correctly, because that one, you know what, the town folk would run you out if you keep calling this the town of Berlin. 
We'd be, yeah. Looks so. like I'm tearing <laughs> off on a good note, huh? Absolutely. <laughs> Very good. Absolutely. <laughs> Excellent. And that leaves uh, Molly on the hot seat. I know, yes, really. Molly, what do you got? And <laughs> okay, so the second would be a full time hire. Um, so obviously, the uh, kind of the sudden re uh, resignation by Officer Welch kind of caught us by surprise. And we quickly, quickly moved into a full time hiring process. Um, and looking at candidates that either had the full time police academy or, or did not, um, you know, ultimately we, we try, have in the past, have tried to hire someone that has a full time academy, one for speed and ease of getting them on the road, but also some of the costs that are associated with that. Um, but in this process, the best candidate did not have the academy. Um, and I want to introduce Molly. Um, Molly is a 2019 graduate of the University of Alabama. Um, so that's, uh, to me, that was, uh, you know, that was something that you don't often see around here. Um, <laughs> but she grew up in, in Marlboro, um, All-American high school rugby player, which I think is pretty cool. Um, she actually played um, college rugby at, at AIC for a while before she uh, she landed at, um, at Alabama, and uh, you know, she works currently uh, at the Walden Street School in Concord with um, with troubled uh, young girls, girls twelve to twenty ish, um, that have either been the victims of trauma or mental illness. Um, so she brings a, a wide range of experience um, even at a young age. So um, Molly, if you'd like to introduce yourself to the board. Wow. Um, yeah, like you said, uh, born and raised. I'm from Marlboro. Uh, graduated in 2015 from Marlboro High. I was a soccer and a rugby player throughout high school. Um, I did go D1 for rugby, um, and then I got injured, which actually did land in me uh, in Alabama. Um, I got my bachelor's in criminal justice with a concentration in cybercrime, and I interned down there, and I worked at the university police department. Um, I wasn't on patrol. I was up in the investigations division. Um, I did a lot of cool stuff down there. And yeah, like you said, I work at a trauma reform school for young ladies, a very diverse population. Um, a lot of intervention and management and trying to rehabilitate them back into functional members of society. I'm very excited to start with the town. The town of what, Molly? Berlin. There you go. <laughs> Um, so it's going to take, uh, it'll take us some time to get Molly up to speed. Um, we are, we have a spot reserved in the next uh, Worcester Police Academy. Um, they just haven't given us a start date. Um, if not, there are two uh, state MPTC academies that will be running just after the beginning of the year. So we're going to get her into the, uh, the best fit for an academy and get her uh, up and running soon. And fortunately, Dylan uh, has already completed the reserve intermittent academy and uh, we'll be able to start field training almost right away. I see. So Dylan will be out on the road. We can see him in a cruiser coming yes. near, near to your house. Okay. Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> um, what other? So the other pre-employment, uh, the pre-employment medicals and things like that, we still have to. Yeah, um, Dylan's completed the medical, um, but we'll have to run Molly through. Um, there's quite a more, few more steps to that. We met yep. last week, and we'll uh, we'll meet again probably early next week to go okay. over the next steps in the process. And as the board knows, I will not make any appointments until all the pre-employment requirements right. are, are met. All right. Well, we do have a motion and a second on the table. So do I hear, should we take a vote? Sure. Keith, Keith, aye. Stone, aye. Hawkins, aye. Welcome aboard. Awesome. Thank you so Thank much. You Congratulations. Much. Thanks. You're welcome. You. Look forward to it. Right. I will reach out to both of you uh, in the next few days, and we'll, uh, we'll set up some meetings early next week. Awesome. And if there's yep. anything that yep. Dylan or Molly that you need, reach out to any of us. We're uh, happy to help. We've all been around in town for long enough that, um, you know, we can give you any background or any information that you need. So happy to help. And tell you where not to sit because those are the places I speed by. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It was, it was nice seeing both of you. Welcome Thank aboard. You. Congratulations. Thank you. All right. Let's see, where are we? Ah, uh, up, we're at the yep. authorized town administrator to sign the recreation committee bill schedules. So um, moved. Oh, okay. And seconded. So, yeah, so Margaret, did you get, I know that you had questions or Mar Mary may have sent them to Julie, did you get all yeah. those straightened out? I'm not, I'm not signing off on anything at the moment because we are waiting for a complete uh, invoice, uh, a prior okay. invoice, and then Julie is checking on other things. So I will not be signing off on anything until 
confirmation is received from Julie and we have proper invoices. Okay. All right. Did I hear a motion? You did. Yeah. It was between the dings right, on your computer. Yep. I know. They're still talking. All right. Uh, then we'll take a vote. Keith, aye. Stone, aye. Hawkins, aye. All right. And the town administrators town administrators request to dispose of surplus equipment. Yeah, so there is a 2011 cruiser um, that needs to be disposed of. This can be sold by resale on any um, legitimate and um, online uh, marketplace site. I did note um, in my memo from last week that the Kelly Blue Book resale estimate would be attached. I was not able to get that today, but I did do a little preliminary research and it looked to be about $1,200 that I think we could ask um, for this cruiser. Um, that would be a cruiser in fair condition. So uh, we're going to, I think that's where we would start with what Kelly Blue Book recommends and see what we can get. It's a classic. It's is it one of the last years they made the Crown Vic? Yeah, well, yeah, they just don't make them anymore. Yeah. So it is the final year. So it's the yeah. last one. See? That's going to be a selling point. We're going to, we're going to get several. I've already had one, hundreds one, of thousands for it. Yeah, I've had one inquiry of someone who would like to purchase it to ship it to Ireland. So oh, it's I, that much of a classic, see? <laughs> no, just put it up on it blocks and put it. 1500. Put it up on uh, blocks, put it in the center of town with some Christmas lights on it. We'll be good. There you go. I'm just always <laughs> happy when we get rid of something out of inventory. So. <laughs> Hurry up, uh, Scott, because it'll go, go, in a, go it'll go in a yeah, barn so, if we so don't. I think move that's it. I think that's ISO move. <laughs> yeah. Yes. To allow the TA to sell these. Sell it. Yep. Sell away, Margaret. You are seconded. Okay, okay Chief. Let's sell this. Right. Chief, Chief I. Don't I. Hawkins I. Thank you. Uh, oh. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the proposed uh, amendment to the policy for disposal of surplus equipment. Yeah, right. this is the second time that I've brought I brought this request to place things on online market sites. I thought maybe it's time to actually allow it by policy. Gotcha. Um, so this adds yeah. that last bullet and changes all the references um, from selectmen to select board. All right. Minor. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. Okay. I'll take a vote. Keith, aye. Stone, aye. Hawkins, aye. Okay, thank I you. thought Chris was just, I thought Chris was using the ding as her eye. Yeah, really. Oh my God. <laughs> and now my husband is chatting with them too. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so was I, was I, I didn't uh, like freeze or anything today? No, tonight. No, you just did. Okay, <laughs> we we had we had a friend of mine's son come over, and he's be an apprentice to being an electrician, and he wired me, hardwired me to my office. So nope. yay, seems to be working. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we're down to board questions and comments. Go for it, Beck. I only have just, I only have four. Um, one, Scott, Margaret, don't forget, drafts by Friday, silence yep. means acceptance. Um, yep. Let's see. Da, 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 da. Did you get my, did you get the list of the appointing authorities today? That I did. Draft? I saw, I saw okay. it come in. I didn't look at it. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, let's see. Do, 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 do. Tomorrow's meeting, I can't make on Richard's Drive, I had a meeting pop up today at two. So I just wanted I'm, to let I, you know. I'm unlikely to make it as well. I've, I've been pulled into two repairs. Okay. okay. And then, uh, uh, you know how Berlin's trying to do like the holiday festive thing. I noticed mm -hmm. that I think Northboro or, or surrounding towns are trying to do it too. So hopefully we'll get some uh, folks that sign up for it besides Julie Lee. That's how you can always tell that it's Christmas time in Berlin. The Lee family is out there in mass decorating their yard. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. I saw them doing it this weekend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, that's all I got. Yep. Okay. Um, 
I knew when, when Dennis was talking earlier, I was thinking maybe one of the things that we could put on an agenda is the pluses and minuses of quarterly billing. Yeah. Yeah. And um, how we get the word out. Um, yeah. Cause people are, people are going to have an opinion. So right. we're going to have to figure out how to get, uh, get to them. Yeah. I, I have an opinion and it's not favorable. So someone's <laughs> going to have to change my mind if we're going to go somewhere. Okay. <laughs> Well, that's the, why I want to the, hear the, the double the work negative. doesn't seem to be a fun thing. I, I don't get why we're trying to simplify things and doubling the work. If, yeah. if some of those issues with cash flow could re, be resolved through the school district agreement, that would help. That would go a long way to helping in this. Well, I think we can do that. I think I think we need to do that. Yep. Yeah. All right. Uh, and I really don't have any questions or comments either. So, and we have no need for an executive session tonight. So I would take. Oh, wait a minute, one question for we go. Really... Yeah. Okay. All right. So we're meeting next Monday, which is the 30th. Mm -hmm. On the 7th, we're not having a selectman meeting, but there's a meeting. No, you're shaking your head. That's go right. Ahead. No selectman's meeting, but a... the shared streets. That's right. And okay. then our coffee talk is the 10th. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. I'm good. Okay. And okay. So um, I take the motion to adjourn. Moved. Second. Second.